I want to mention, Taku is smiling because he is making remarks on that. Um, I, want to, I want to introduce some people, and they're not all here, but I just want to mention some names. Um, first of all, there is Vivian, who's doing all the videotaping through the Jamboree, which is great. Of course, there's Taku, who has curated the whole, almost the whole Jamboree, which is an enormous amount of work, so thank you, Taku. <laughs> And next to talk is Christina, who is uh, our, uh, our main blogger, or one of the main bloggers. Thank you, Christina. <laughs> well, Frank is just sitting in the back. He did his work yesterday, and that's all he's going to do, I think. So, but <laughs> thanks anyway. <laughs> and one person who's not here um, is Minouk, who uh, is from the office, and she has done a lot of work on like the food and the drinks, which is an important part. Um, He's next door, so uh, say thank you, Vicky. Uh, <laughs> Welcome. <coughs> That's June, actually, who is uh, one of our <laughs> who's one of our interns and uh, does a good job at helping people out. Also, <laughs> if you have an idea of people at, who the people at time are, so if you have any questions, you can just come to us and uh, we are. Um, then talk about which this is Daniel Shornow. Um, um, I'm Robert van Heim, and we both actually do a, have done a lot of work on project support in the last couple of years. Daniel started this a long time ago, I kind of took over. Um, that's why actually we, we organized this mapping session because it's mainly a, a lot of different, uh, different uh, uh, examples of mapping um, from the projects we have been doing. Um, so Daniel and me will be hosting this. Um, when we talked about uh, doing a mapping session, um, we realized pretty soon again that actually mapping is a pretty broad subject. There's all kinds of different ways of mapping. Um, the typical time one, of course, is the instrumental mapping, uh, mapping gestures onto um, virtual parameters, basically. We'll see examples of that. Um, there's also mapping in the space, uh, in diffusion, in diffused sound which we'll see an example of. Um, then there's uh, uh, data visualization, which is also kind of a mapping, mapping yeah, uh, an enormous amount of data onto visuals, which we will see an example of. Um, actually, also we're looking for a game designer, because that's another way of mapping, and especially with the weaving folder uh, around so much, we would think it would be interesting, but they didn't respond. So um, I think they... Yes, but it was a little very late as well. So. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. But I was thinking it's a different kind of mapping, like their work on the time scale. They were too busy. So. Um, I think that's it about the general introduction. It's a busy program. We'll have six presentations with a break in the middle. Um, we will start with uh, Akao Tanaka, who has been artistic director um, at the time in 2007. <laughs> And I have to think about it because he's around still quite a lot. 2006? No, something. Yeah, seven. Um, he's been around a lot this year also to, uh, to work with Jorgen, our instrument maker, on his new instrument, or his, like his, the, the next version of his new instrument, the Biomuse. Um, it just finished the harder part of it, and I'm guessing he needs a lot of, like the next couple of months to finish the software part of it. Or, yeah. So uh, he will demonstrate a bit of that. And, uh, Thanks to Robert and everyone's time. Um, the timing was good because I did finish the, the instrument just yesterday with Jorgen. Uh, it's a new version of the instrument that Robert says, but uh, the old part, I will sort of do a before and after. So what I'm wearing now is the before. Um, many of you have seen it. Uh, it's, it's called the Biomuse. It takes uh, muscle tension signals uh, through electrodes uh, that are picking up neuron impulses of muscle contraction. And uh, now in this case, um, sending them wirelessly to the computer. So it's a kind of signal that I've been using now for 15 years. Uh, back in the old days, it was not at all wireless. Uh, it was using wet uh, 
electrodes from the hospital. Uh, and slowly, uh, and this is in work with uh, Ben Knapp, who will be here Thursday, um, he developed um, um, active electronics and dry electrodes uh, that I uh, should have got one out to see, um, that pick up a differential electrical signal along a muscle group, uh, digitizes it and sends it to the computer. So here we have one, two, three, four muscle groups. So let me get this up and running. You can see it. Um, hopefully the demo gods will be with me because I'm really going to crank it all up, add the new sensors as we go along. So we'll make a, first a, a serial connection over Bluetooth with my left arm. That's this uh, cube. Okay, that looks okay. We add a serial port. Power up this one. And connect to the second IQ. So I'm using the IQ uh, um, as my digitizer. And so now I've got two incoming serial ports. And here, if I set them to the right, maybe in and out. We initialize. So, okay, we're starting to get some data from this guy. We initialize the right arm set, and we start to get some data from this guy. So, all right. So it seems to be working. Uh, well, what you're seeing, no, okay, let's not look at the right. You don't see that. Okay. Well, what's, what we want to focus on is here because I don't have the extra, uh, the new sensors attached. That's the right hand of the, of, of the system. Uh, nothing's happening yet from the biosensors because I haven't turned the audio on. Um, so what I'm doing is actually in here immediately going into the audio domain uh, with the signal object. So I'm treating the biosignal uh, in the audio domain to do filtering um, and smoothing and so forth. So now we get, okay. So down the four faders down below, you see tension in the outer left, tension in the inner left, tension in the outer right, and inner right arm. And you see it's a very, very lively signal. This is even after some smoothing we did. Take the smoothing off, and so you see on the oscilloscope the kind of it's a it's an aperiodic stochastic signal. So although I'm treating it in the audio domain, it's not at all an audio light signal, but it's very complex. And we can really smoothen it out a bit and get more smooth control data. And this is how I performed for 15 years basically. And, and as you can see, it's I mean I can move my hands like this, but it's really about power tension in the muscle. So it's a very very uh, interesting kind of uh, input uh, in that it's gesture, but it's not necessarily connected to motion. Right? If it's through motion, I can articulate certain muscle tension trajectories, okay, but I don't have to move. And this is where it's interesting and problematic. So, just to finish the before, if I want to play some sounds with this so you get an idea, um, let's go here. So, I'm playing sounds out of this patch that the Manuel Poletti. Uh, help me with. You'll, you'll see he's got the new version of the patch. I've been stuck on an old version, so I had to pull out an old computer. But, uh, and you'll see the problem now. Basically, in performance, I would actually have to go over to the computer and turn something on, fiddle around, classic sort of thing. So the problem here is that um, <coughs> it's running on a laptop, but it shouldn't be a laptop performance. But once it's going, uh, when the sound is on. And here I've got very simple mapping. Mm -hmm. You see the, the horizontal slider down on the bottom there. By going this way and pulling down. By going this way. Okay. So it's maybe it's just pitch band. Okay. And on this one, this sound, you see the, the two green sliders up on the right. So in some ways it's a violin metaphor, it's pitch, but it's, it's a little bit more sophisticated than that because it is treating some different parameters of granular synthesis. But I want something that's fairly direct. And I could also 
then change the smoothing here. Okay, let's, uh, let's go back here. Let's change it. If I'm to change the sound, I can change it clicking here. Okay, we go to higher. And now if we take the smoothing off. So you start to see the richness of the signal. Okay. Let's say it was the state of things before. And one problem is a lot of fiddling around on the computer, um, which is a kind of a distraction for me and for the audience because part of the, mm -hmm. the joy of playing the system it is, is kind of free space, no connection, untethered, gestural uh, control of sound. So I'm going to try something very risky here and add the new instrument. <coughs> by, let's see. Is your organ here? No. Okay. You took pictures along the way. All right, so I'll, actually, I'll do this myself. This time. So what I did with the organ was to extend this instrument with non-bio sensors, made a glove that has a 2D accelerometer on the back and a three-way switch on the bottom, and these just go in 0 to 5 volt inputs. So the switch is actually a, a resistor ladder uh, that I made with unique values. Uh, so pressing each switch or any combination of switches gives me a unique resistance value to go in a, in a, in a 5 volt to continuous voltage input. So this I use as a 3 bit number 0, 1, 0, 2, 0, 4, and any combination to give me uh, 8 values. So flip this around. Put this in. And you sort of see the marks that the electrodes leave. They're like coin sized gold plated um, metal bits with uh, powered by, through the 5 volts coming out of the IQ, the active electronics so in the electrode bar. Okay. And then a little convenient pocket. This is Jorgen, a little convenient pocket to put away the extra wire. And we've got a really nice self-contained thing. We do that for the right. Once again, yeah, the, the IQ connectors are very fragile, but with Jorgen, as you can see, he's made them shrink wrapped, going in in a unique orientation. So very stage ready. All right. And then just sliding it back up. Like this. And oh, putting the cable over. This is the first time I put the sensors on in front of people. Okay. All right. So. Now if we go back here, okay, so now the data, oh, right, okay, now the data over here starts to mean something. All right, so, uh, so the 2D accelerometer here, if you look at the square 2D sliders, you get tilt in this direction, okay, and then tilt in this direction. And it's all coming, as you can see from above, and I've got uh, it's a 14-bit value coming in, into which I can zoom uh, to look at minimum and maximum, and then that's the sort of range that I'm dealing with to give me a full range output down here. And likewise for left and right. And that's the sort of calibration uh, that I do beforehand, and likewise for the right arm, up and down, and left and right. And as you can see, they're not actually completely decoupled. As I do that, you see the muscle tension actually also being activated. They seem a little bit overactive because I've actually undone one of them. Okay. But I could theoretically now tense in one position, do the similar kinds of muscle tension up here. And so this starts to create uh, a multimodal interaction space, whereas before, 
muscle tension wasn't based on position or movement. So I could do a, I could do a tension like this, but I could have done it strapped to a hospital bed. Now I can actually differentiate between the same muscle tension here and somewhere up here because I've got this sort of second mode of, of uh, uh, tilt data uh, to dis dis distinguish wiggling, finger, uh, wiggling fingers here as opposed to wiggling fingers here. Right? So that's the kind of thing that I'm interested in starting to look at in the synthesis. And as Robert said, well, I haven't worked on that yet. This just got finished yesterday, but it seems to be working. So I did a quick uh, patch of <coughs> taking that same sound and running it from, from these additional uh, sensors and using our switches to see if I could get around uh, without having to fiddle with the computer. So let's see how that goes. We'll come back and look at this. And Okay. So, for instance, before I went turning the system on, I had to go to the computer. If the system is now running, if I hold the middle button and then tilt up, you see the yellow fader, the master volume control, start to come up. Okay. Whereas before, I had the sound already on, and you know, I walked on. Okay. okay. And now I'd like to control the the whistling sound to separate it into the two arms. It's still power, amplitude over here, amplitude over here, I've got two whistling sounds. And now it's the tilt and x axis, okay. which is the pitch here, and here, the other one. So, so I'm playing with two voices now, and the tension gives me the So one way, comes the other, high, huh? low, Presets as well, switching to a different sound.
questions? Comments? Anyone want to try? I have a question. Yeah. Um, I wonder if like, now you actually treat both hands yeah. the same, in the same way, yeah. like it's left and right. Yeah. Of course, it's just the starting. Right. Why well, you write years on there? Like, we can also imagine like yeah. different functions for both hands. Yeah. Yeah, I have to think a little bit. It might take a couple of years. You know, I mean, I'm still using Manuel's old touch. It's a question of time, laziness. And yeah. It's been the same instrument uh, over over more than ten years. Suddenly, it's got a new addition. I have this. Okay, let's use a whistling sound for that. Uh, I think I sleep the other day, so we'll, we'll start to see. Um, but another, I had used the uh, electrodes up here, which was quite nice, because um, this starts to fit this tension. So there were a couple of pieces where I, that tension gave me something. Of course, you could put this anywhere. I mean, if you put it here, and you start to do the muscle man show, it's not less subtle. Um, but indeed, uh, yeah, some kind of asymmetry between the two uh, has been something I've played with in the old system, okay. so I can imagine. You just talked about the uh, uh, coupling that you got yeah. between uh, the, the tension in the muscles and the position that yeah. you emphasize for the accelerometer. So that also creates <coughs> a coupling between the parameters within the synthesis system. Yes. And so how? What What are your thoughts on on, on the link that this creates? Because then you get a link in in, in the sound as well. Yeah. Um, so did you? Pick the parameters on purpose yeah. where they yeah. were. It's part of the instrument. Kind of it, it makes it feel more like a an organic uh, instrument mm -hmm. in a way. It's no longer a synthesis patch where you're saying, oh, this fader will control mm -hmm. only this parameter, mm -hmm. this parameter will control mm -hmm. only this parameter. Real, well, let's say traditional uh, acoustic mm -hmm. instruments are not like that. You mm -hmm. cannot separate mm -hmm. completely one thing from the other. And then this is a similar instrument mm -hmm. from the input side. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. And uh, and then so on, on the synthesis side, I I, I try to um, uh, yeah to, to, to think about building my sounds uh, in in that way. So the so you see that um, well it's hard to tell, but I mean even though it's just pitch and amplitude, it is other things that are built in there that we barely hear, like the stretch factor of the granular synthesis. Okay. Uh, here's the transposition, there's the volume, but uh, and then where I'm actually uh, placing the playback head in the middle of the sound. Uh, so now, this is a whistly, almost white noise-like sound, so it's very, very subtle, but I think that's the kind of thing that, that I'm building into my sounds that makes it live a little bit, that makes it different from just pink noise uh, mm -hmm. uh, to flag out. Um, and, and the way, so that's from the sound uh, and, and, and music side, um, from the side, this is where all the mappings take place. Uh, so it's in here. This is a system that Manuel uh, created uh, banks of, of maps. It's, it's a subpatrick called map control. And so you can take something at the input, you get uh, a parameter coming in. So this may be muscle one or accelerator, accelerator one. You can scale it, uh, add to it, uh, apply curves to it, and then send it dynamically to a, a, a destination parameter. So all the things that I'm doing in fact, is actually programming mappings in these boxes you know, that, that I'm flipping through, um, uh, sending uh, these input uh, to different places. So for the moment, this guy is not moving, uh, but uh, in another setup, I'll rewrite this one if it does. Yeah. So, Parker, you have a question? Well, what kept me working with it for 15 years is, once again, I'm lazy. Uh, I don't have that much time. But it was also a very rewarding instrument, so it felt good. And I think that's really important for a musical instrument. And it, it was philosophical in the way that you don't learn a violin and then throw it away and learn a saxophone. I mean, you might pick up the saxophone being a violinist and start to learn more instruments, but uh, we don't replace musical instruments in the way that we, we replace our laptops and our uh, technology. So I was interested in finding a technological instrument with which I could live for a long time and, and, and find a deeper relationship. So that's why it's been a long time. 
it's gotten more convenient over time because it was wet hospital electrodes ten years ago, now it's dry electrodes. These are commercially available through the iCube uh, manufacturer infusion system, so any of you can, can buy it. They're about 300 uh, Canadian dollars for a trip, for one muscle uh, pickup, and some more people are starting to use it. And uh, um, so I'm, I'm interested to share what I know. Um, and there's, there's been some initial <coughs> feedback coming back from the inventor of the map, who's in Belfast, working with some students. Uh, so they are interested in it, and I think people will find their own ways to use, use this. At the same time, I think we'll find that muscle sensing will start to figure out why I'm, I use them on my forearms. It's very musical. I've tried it on dancers on different parts of the body, the back, and so forth. Uh, as you know, here. And, and some of the feedback has been, oh, people try it, and they, and they go, they try to make a sound, and they say, oh, well, I can't do that. That's very atau like So indeed, I've been the only one using this instrument, and I've played a lot. Uh, so people recognize that, but then want to do something different. That's natural. But I think we'll find out some qualities of the instrument that are kind of characteristics of the instrument, Idi idiomatic gestures for the instrument, much in the way that I'm firing. You can make certain sounds in similar ways for whoever the performers are. And that's a quality of the instrument itself, which I think is important. Yeah. I was wondering if you've ever thought of even just referring to the muscles that are used, the muscles as actuators. Yeah. You know, the way you can use spasms and, uh, yeah. and stuff to actually yeah. force your movements. Have you ever experimented with that? Stellark has done that. I know that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, and so he's one of, you know, from the mid 90s, he's one of the artists with whom I've had interesting sure, conversations. Sure, you just known the, the principle of it, but I'm just wondering if a, if a certain, uh, if, if, if a element of involuntary. Yeah. Well, and as, and, you know, it, it, yeah. Well, and it's very time like, especially now with the Wii modes and stuff, to look for inexpensive, commercially available things on the market. And the actuators that are out there on the market are uh, weight loss uh, electrical mm. electrodes. So, <laughs> but if I lose any more weight, I, I might disappear. So, but, uh, <laughs> uh, okay. um, yeah, In involuntary action could be interesting. But indeed, as you can see, what I do is very musicianly, it's very voluntary. Uh, action. Uh, yeah, it could be interesting to you look at something voluntary. Yeah. This is sort of a Just, development yeah. tool. Well, putting it elsewhere on the body, you re uh, it's on the forearms because we play instruments with our arms, and this is where we have a lot of control. It's these muscles, but these are the muscles that control our hands and fingers. Uh, putting it elsewhere on the leg, for example, you try this to do you know, virtual kick drum or something, and you realize, well, you're using uh, your leg muscles all the time. They're always tense, so you can't. Uh, and in fact, uh, the virtual kick drum never worked. It was always out of phase because the kick drum would trigger off when you lifted your foot rather than when you foot down or <coughs> artifacts like that. I think it's time for one more question. Ah, Jamie, you no, I know Jamie, so something. <laughs> oh, yeah, uh, just a quick comment was that um, heart rate monitors are a source for these electrodes as well as yeah. the differential amplifiers. Mm -hmm. so that's a cheap way to go. Um, my other question is sort of regarding your practice, mm -hmm. like over the last 15 years, do you feel like you've developed a lot of um, sort of muscle mem memory vocabulary mm -hmm. versus like listening and knowing how the patch works and mm -hmm. trying to get to that mm -hmm. combination of parameters? Um, and then, and if it is more so on the muscle memory side, do you worry that like with this multimodal mm -hmm. capability that you're adding to it, that that's going to kind of distract from your ability to get back to specific? Yeah, but that's why I say it's a new instrument, so maybe I'll have new patterns that I, I'll find. I definitely have, I mean, if people have seen me perform, and if people who are picking this up now say, oh, that's too a towel, I, I have a way that I've developed over time, and, and, and uh, there are certain positions that work, there are ways, you realize that making the maximum tension isn't just clenching a fist, sometimes very, you know, simple gesture like that can give you maximum tension here. So there are certain gestures that, that, that work, um, and, once again, since I'm uh, like any musician, lazy and don't practice, I forget my patch. And so mid-performance, I'm sitting there trying to, f these mappings are very complex, so I'm trying to remember just by twitting my mind, okay, so what was, where, where, where in the sound, inside that timbre am I, yeah. am I operating? And Do you think the multimodal thing might make it more difficult to remember? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, there was a certain simplicity with muscle only. Yeah. That, um, yeah. Okay. okay, thank you very much. Thank you.
you have a little bit of a take of uh, the difference. I mean, uh, at Stein here, we've developed uh, physical interfaces, made instruments from a musician's point of view, like what you've just seen a beautiful example that the Tau is doing for a long time. So in this more bottom-up approach from having a, the connectivity towards uh, you know, physicality towards your music or maybe also your video art uh, and uh, more and more the other way around uh, uh, attenuating external devices again. Uh, while this is, uh, has been happening a lot, uh, uh, it's also been interesting to, uh, to sometimes look at uh, alternative groups of users like uh, in, in the more uh, uh, modern music world where people uh, compose us the way that they often want to work with, which is more a top-down approach of being able to do a lot of these things but not necessarily developing themselves. So, uh, and as time, uh, since we've always sort of slightly criticized uh, the Max uh, user community for, for being uh, bottom-up and being chaotic and in the end losing control of their patches, uh, uh, and finding a way of dealing with this complexity metaphor within our own software, Lisa and Frank's case. Uh, it was very beautiful to uh, uh, start a collaboration with, uh, with a forum new music th theater in Stuttgart, which was uh, initiated and uh, run by Andreas Breitscheid, who unfortunately cannot be here. And he collaborated with uh, Manuel Poletti from IRCAM, which uh, I will give the word in a second. Uh, on a uh, Max library, which is taking a lot of the tools of uh, the trade, so to speak, of uh, analysis of frequency domain, uh, analysis processing mapping, resynthesis, what we used to call voice processing, so really on the, uh, on the actual sound uh, <coughs> uh, signal. So they together developed a, a tool uh, that they called MP tools or MOP tools these days. Uh, I think uh, this is where I give it over to Manuel. Manuel Pellet is a musician. He's a, a life electronic designer. Uh, and uh, I'm very happy that uh, we're able to have him here. Welcome. Um, so it will be um, a slow English presentation. So correct me if I'm too bad. Um, so uh, the, the idea is uh, that presentation or the theme is mapping and uh, Daniel asked me what can you do with that so uh, I had the idea uh, as I, I guess that there would be some people like Atau, I didn't guess he would be there but that's a funny uh, history because uh, we started, we've made that patch together three, four, five years ago <coughs> and just after Andreas Patchheit um, hired me or called me to to design this uh, uh, Max library, and it, it's really the uh, the continuation of what was the made with the Atau. So it's funny that we just present uh, one after the other. So this is our, maybe the, your future uh, tool. Let's see. Um, and um, okay, um, about mapping, uh, it's not really the concern of the whole library. Uh, la uh, the, the the real concern is more to provide uh, tools, um, modular tools, let's say, to musicians or artists or composers uh, within a sympathetic environment like Max, like graphic object, so you don't spend uh, all, the, all your free time to just to patch. Uh, that's the idea. And there are some, some mapping uh, um, modules that help you to connect the different modules together so uh, you can uh, um, create some interactivity. So I, I won't be long on the tools themselves uh, because there are, there are too many modules, but basically you can see the different uh, topics covered by, by each module. I can show you one or two just very quickly. Um, like, uh, I don't know, uh, maybe the last one I, I did uh, like this. So uh, this document just opened some help files and basically we, pr we try to provide an object that will create some effect. Could be a MIDI object, an uh, audio object, uh, or uh, analysis tool, or sampling tool, whatever. Um, something which is put in one box and with some inlets and some message it can understand. And then uh, just uh, nearby, we, we have uh, an interface which is uh, able to control that uh, module. And you see that they have a small label like a name. 
And that's the base of mapping things together, that we know that some guys are there and you can call them and tell them some, some things. So to just give you a, a very uh, rough idea of how it sounds or what it does, uh, let's take this. <coughs> like for example, Yeah, the sort of um, spectrum compressor. I will try to transform the sound well, with different parameters. And like this, you have uh, dozens of effects. And um, um, someone like Olivier Pasquet contributed to make those uh, special effects, like uh, especially DSP, uh, uh, FFT effect, FFT based effect. Uh, so uh, anyone could contribute to uh, to the library, so it, it grows uh, uh, over time and uh, get richer uh, year after year. Um, and this is also a sort of past of future because uh, 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 it's uh, version Max 4 and should be ported to Max 5, hopefully soon, but will take time. So to illustrate um, how to use this, uh, in, a, in a performance context, so I will show you a very serious uh, classical music, contemporary music from Irkan that just was just performed in last October. And, uh, uh, the, and the, the idea was very simple, we had no time. Uh, <laughs> yes. The composer, so uh, I, I must maybe uh, say that uh, my job uh, at Irkan is to host um, composers who come for residencies and I accompany them for weeks, days, weeks, or months, or even years, uh, in order to, to, to help them uh, design the instrument they will be using in a concert or a performance. Uh, so they often um, are um, um, asked by a uh, music ensemble to write a piece, and they write a score, they, they send the score to, to the ensemble or the performer, and then uh, there's a moment where there's the concert and we uh, are all together uh, in a room and uh, for maybe a 10 minute piece you, are, you will have to make all those things, very complex things, ready uh, and performant and etc. So it's a bit of a kind of weird um, um, uh, approach but that um, asks us, uh, live electronic designers at IRCAM, to, uh, to have, let's say, an uh, efficient tool. Uh, they must work because otherwise if, if it's the computer crashes then it's done. There will be uh, only a few chances that we play the piece again. So that's the context and uh, of course composers are, are, are very busy people and uh, sometimes they just arrive at the arcana and say I don't know what to do exactly, what can we do? So, um, yeah. so uh, with composers Luis now, um, I think, ah, yes you can see him. It, it's the IRCAM uh, concert hall, and uh, there was a piece for percussions uh, and live electronics. Uh, he, he, told, he told me, well, we should be very fast and it should be amazing. <laughs> so, <laughs> something like that. Uh, and it was uh, clever because, uh, okay, we, we, we chose uh, um, um, a set of effects he liked uh, that could fit that part of the, of the score or that part, and then uh, put that all together uh, within a patch um, and then uh, try to make some interesting sound out of that. And it's not because you have nice tools or nice effects that will, you will make something interesting. So the, the story is, uh, is more, the concern is more uh, in the score. Um, um, usually, uh, just to illustrate uh, uh, one more time, at Adircam you will have uh, typically some pieces where at uh, such bar and such beat, uh, there will be that trigger that will uh, uh, route the input audio to such effect, and then the next beat, it will be closed, and you have a very complex cue list to, to perform. And uh, we decided to do exactly the contrary. So uh, there's a basic, very, uh, let's say, powerful uh, tool that can be um, seen as an instrument. And we have only a few cues just to change sometimes the, what we don't want, in fact. Um, I will try to, uh, to, to, to make a, a short example. Um, so the idea is that the, the performer 
while he will be playing all those uh, uh, keys and uh, different um, uh, toys there, um, will trigger some audio information. <coughs> and we have, uh, for those who know Max and the audio uh, part of Max, we have nice um, objects that are able to track some information within the audio, like uh, uh, attack detection. Uh, that would trigger a bang a message uh, whenever you hit something or you do uh, something like that. Or, um, uh, for example, a pitch or amplitude following. And just out of that, uh, we were able to, to set up very quickly uh, an instrument that was able to follow the score, um, uh, follow the instrument uh, gesture, but without any spe special sensor uh, other than uh, a normal microphone or something. So that was the, the, the goal, to have uh, something very obvious for, for the musician. And in fact, uh, he will, the musician will trigger and uh, act uh, on, uh, on the whole process all the time. So I will try to, to uh, give you a, a short example. Um, this is so the, the interface for the, for the patch, and then after we can have a quick look inside. Um, and, uh, this one will be not nice. and this is the uh, cue, cue list patch where I can trigger some, some events by hand or the musicians with the pedal will trigger some events. Here I have a sort of simulation which is not the, um, the concert, uh, the original one. It was, it was a rough recording we used to set up all those, uh, those effects. Um, and it will play also MIDI file that will automate the, the, the cue, so I don't have anything to do, hopefully. Uh, so the sound may be a bit weird. Uh, I will, I will let, it, let it sound until I hear the, the right things. So let's try. There are also some sound files. So basically, was that sometimes the input sound were sent to one or the other of the effects. Uh, the fact is uh, that in the patch, uh, there's nothing that tells at that moment that this should be done in that effect or that effect. In fact, the, the program choose, chooses uh, uh, the, um, uh, the, the different possible effect according to some constraints, like uh, I will show you now. Um, <coughs> Um, maybe I will, I will take another uh, uh, small sound file with a lot of impact. Like for example, this one. So I think there's a nice drum loop. Just to show you that you can change the music. It's 
So we have a, a sort of random routing of the uh, live audio with different effects, less or more or less weird. So um, now to talk about the, the mapping itself, uh, I should uh, show you a little bit how this is done. So um, this is the center, the core of the patch, which is a audio matrix with audio inputs and outputs. And you are able to route any of the signal to any of the little boxes there, which contain one of the modules like the one we saw just before. So this is quite like a rack of effects with a dynamic mixing console where you could plug and unplug things. Um, here we can, we can see, we can have a, a view, a graphic view of the matrix. So that's, uh, and here are the microphones, the ADCs, and here it's the outputs on the over six channel. And um, here, the, those um, ADCs, those audio inputs, are sent to two analyzers to, that will output some mm -hmm. description of the sound, such as um, the um, uh, attack detection. So if I can retrieve my patch, this, this one. Sorry. Let's keep this. Here, this it's called so-called bonk uh, because uh, it hosts uh, the bonk object from Miller Pocket, which is a simple attack effect that works very well. And here, I can monitor the the effect of the attack detection. So each time there is a little click, it means that the object detected that the, the, the drummer played an impact. It works more or less depending on the instrument and the, and the conditions, but it's a lot of information about uh, what the user, uh, what the player performance is doing. Because I will use that all over the, the, the patch. The second thing, uh, second information, it's this one. Normally, I, I'm not supposed to do that while I'm performing. It's supposed to be a black box with some cues. So I'm not used to manipulate it. Um, so back there, yes. And this one performs a, a sort of pitch follower, follower, which means nothing with uh, with drums, but with um, uh, some other instruments, yes. And also outputs an, uh, some amplitudes. So uh, if I play something like. So the attack is not very meaningful, but the pitch and the amplitude, I can have an idea. Okay. So that's uh, basically the information I have from instrument. And um, I will try to use, uh, for example, that impact to trigger many things uh, in a very simple way. Um, so the, in this patch, I will. Maybe I should play the piece. It should be. It would be easier. Sorry for this. Uh, where is it? Uh, maybe there. Okay. Okay. You see, he tries to say to tell me. Ah, I played something. And. Here I, I receive that attack with a max object that can send a, a message uh, anywhere. And I will use it as a, as a main trigger for, especially, where is it now? This. This is the, uh, the high microphones of the, over the, the percussion set. And with each bang, I want maybe to uh, root Input signal to one of the effects, maybe or not, depending on some conditional uh, uh, C 
syntax that say maybe you have the right to go there, maybe not, maybe you should go more to the frequency shifter than the delay. So instead of really writing something precise, we let the computer choose one of those possibilities. Um, and what you see at the output, it's the overall, it's the, um, the connection from any uh, effect to uh, the loudspeakers. And you see that it moves all the time and uh, it moves randomly but within a, a certain within a certain constraint. And this is already, already still made here. Uh, here I received the amplitude and the pitch. I'm not using the pitch actually. And with this, I will uh, have uh, some arguments to say, well, if the, um, if the amplitude is low, will it does that do something? Okay, I will uh, try to summarize that. Um, summarize that. Um, if the amplitude is low, send, it, send the sound, the sound of any effect, uh, to the first speakers there, which are around, which are, uh, should be faster. Well, we'll have to wrap that in one second. If you could uh, find a way towards... Uh, I try. Uh, okay. It's a lot. All right. So, the louder uh, the performer will play, uh, the more uh, into the room the sound, the electronic sound will be projected into the into the room. So it gives an effect that when you see the, 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 the performance, if you play piano, you have a sound which is moving around randomly around uh, uh, around the, the performer. And as soon as uh, uh, it will be loud, um, then the sound is really projected uh, in, in the room. Um, there are some different small things, like for example, I always use. This is a connection here to a river, a six-channel river, um, which is totally random. And for each impact detected, we will choose if the live sound is sent to the river or not, and if the effects are, are sent to the river or not. And the effect of that is that you have a re reverb sound, but it's not always there. It's, it depends. And sometimes the, the effect will be very dry, and sometimes not. Um, so, uh, just to, for, for, to finish, I, I, I play another uh, small part. So, the second piece, in fact. Which has all, all other um, settings. Here we have a more uh, sweet music, and uh, we, we force uh, the, the triggering by some random metronomes and things like that, and to, in order to create a sort of uh, overall material, um, we should uh, be in the context to, to see that when the, the performer stops playing, well, nothing happens really. It's really all what you hear as a strange material is made by this uh, instrument, uh, improvis improvisation. Uh, instrument. already half designing, redesigning, and showing how it was designed. How much did, uh, 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 because you said it's a very, it used a very generic way of making it an instrument with the performer, how much did the musical idea afterwards change once that was uh, 
created to compose on. Um, it was put on top of what he already had. Did he change anything? Uh, go back and change? He wanted uh, he wanted to have a, a kind of uh, organic uh, live electronics that mm -hmm. avoids this painful, uh, you know, Q uh, Q uh, list mm -hmm. uh, editing, uh, but that could fit his music. So mm -hmm. I proposed some some process. He said oh, that could be good, and then we finally choose okay two kilos of that, two of that, mm -hmm. and two of that, and and then. Um, uh, he composed according to some uh, constraints, like attack. <laughs> there should be a, some uh, attack, and uh, and very qu quickly we uh, we came to the point, uh, and and was, that was okay. It was very simple, in fact. Once we had something uh, to play with, uh, then the things are. Um, I would have liked the time to play a totally different music and show you that it works too. So, that's, yeah. if you're interested. Oh yeah, I would be. I mean, I had uh, the benefit of using this library in a, in a, in a project, which is a new media protocol for which used uh, real-time sound processing as well. Uh, which brings me to another question. This is something that you developed, partly, of course, uh, also with Andres Bajak from the FNM, <coughs> which they've used in projects with uh, Foresight, for instance, uh, yeah. Unit for Monster, and many other projects. Yeah. How available is it to anybody that has Macs and is, has to be on the account list because of the objects? Uh, so I, I must say that I don't know, uh, really, um, uh, because uh, as you know, the forum um, collapsed, and uh, uh, so there was no real agreement. But so it's something I use with the, the people I, I'm working with. So basically, if we were working together, mm -hmm. I could uh, you could play with the tool and keep it for you. But there's no patent or, or nothing mm -hmm. like that. What I would like to do is, of course, now to to rewrite it totally. And maybe not alone because it's a lot of work uh, with Max 5 and a modern, um, uh, you know, GNU or, or what, whatever. So everybody could. Uh, I, I think it has something to do with Jamoma. It's a bit the same kind of uh, tool, but it's more dedicated to musicians or composers rather than Maxers, if you want. Mm -hmm. That's a bit the difference. So, uh, we provide uh, some interfaces, then you can start making sound, um, where I think that Jamoma is more for Maxus. Any questions? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I have a question. Okay, thank you. Okay. Oh.